joining us. It's my great pleasure and privilege to introduce our Department of Medicine ground round speaker today, Professor Ratko Djukanovic, who's also our residency program dream speaker for 2023. Ratko is a very dear friend who I've known for more than 25 years. We collaborated on various research projects and uh, papers. He's currently a professor of medicine at the University of Southampton and has had a lifelong interest in asthma, thus the overlap in our research. Ratko's research has transformed important concepts regarding airway disease, particularly the response to various stimuli such as allergen, viruses, and air pollutants. His work has led to the development of novel understanding of airway disease and creation of new therapeutics. Ratko has provided the first insight into the mechanism of action of important medications for asthma, specifically monoclonal antibody against IgE, the omalizumab, which is used in severe asthma, and also more recently, the role of interferon beta in viral induced asthma exacerbation. Ratko's work has received nearly 100 million pounds in grant funding and led to hundreds of publications in high quality journal, leading to an H index of 95, that is in the stratosphere. As such, he was elected to the NIHR senior investigator status. Ratko has led numerous research programs at Southampton University, the UK, Europe, and across the globe. He has really em em embarked on a number of very important collaborative effort that involving uh, Europe as well as North America. Uh, most importantly, recently he started the European Registry of Severe Asthma that involved 29 European countries along with five pharmaceutical collaborators. Ratko was the first to describe how to use omics approaches to study airway disease, COPD, and asthma, and define asthma phenotype. This work was funded by a major study that's across several European countries and was known as UBiopred, which he co-founded in 2009. And thus far, this has resulted in more than 100 high quality publication. An important focus of Ratko's research has been how to stratify asthma into various groups and phenotypes and help us to understand how to treat this. And this morning, he's gonna tell us why this is important and how it can be done. Welcome, Dr. Jakanovic. Wow, well, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Nizar. I, I wish you were a little bit more subdued in, uh, in your praise of me, because that really ups the stakes. I've got to really deliver this, uh, this speech. So a, a really heartfelt thank you, uh, Nizar. Uh, it really is, uh, it's been a splendid uh, week uh, and what a day to, way to finish today. And many thanks to all of you uh, who, with whom I've had the pleasure of uh, meeting, you know, from the fellows, the residents, colleagues. I, 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 I'm very honored to have known many of you uh, for many years. And uh, I think Professor Bill Bussey was the first reviewer of my, one of my papers. And uh, he was, uh, it was a very uh, interesting time, which I'll uh, uh, tell you about uh, it, uh, during, my, uh, during my talk. Yeah, stratifying asthma is terribly uh, important, I think. It, it applies to all diseases. Uh, and we like to think that asthma is a complex disease, but so is every other disease. Uh, and so I think this does apply if you're uh, a resident in internal medicine. I think the concept, the way to think about disease is it really cuts across all diseases. So these are my disclosures. I was very quiet during the COVID era. So, so I, I, let's start with some simple concept. And this is as simple a slide, but one which summarizes really distills uh, the, the essence of asthma as a disease of chronic inflammation and as a consequence of this chronic insult, damage to the epithelium, activation of the epithelial uh, and uh, tissue repair mechanisms we, that results in a tissue remodeling. And the concept is simple that antigen, which stimulates uh, the immune system via dendritic cells, then goes on to activate uh, T lymphocytes, uh, the key T lymphocyte that we're looking at uh, is, is the Th2, the T helper 2, uh, which produces cytokines, the T2 cytokines, and that goes on to activate cells 
mast cells, the eosinophils, basophils. And on the other hand, here on the right, you see uh, the, the, the damage to the epithelium, the proliferation of fibroblast activation, deposition of, uh, uh, of the matrix, and, and angiogenesis. So, so this, this is really the substrate for this phenomenon of twitchy, uh, hyper-responsive airways uh, that then results in, uh, in symptoms that you're familiar with. Uh, and for those, uh, for the symptoms, we do have uh, a treatment, we have bronchodilators, and for uh, the infl inflammatory component, we've got anti-inflammatory drugs, now more recently biologics. But um, for, the, uh, uh, for the remodeling uh, part of asthma, we do not have treatment. So I'll take you back to uh, uh, what I think uh, uh, Nizar was referring to, this was uh, one of the, if I, I believe it was the second uh, bronchoscopy study, uh, which uh, took a bit of guts because uh, bronchoscopy wasn't done in, in volunteers at the time. So this, this uh, slide shows the uh, immunohistochemical staining for uh, EG2, which is a, a marker of uh, uh, eosinophils. And you can see uh, lots of eosinophils there. Uh, in uh, the submucosa and a few in the epithelium. Now, the striking feature is that uh, healthy individuals have very few, usually less than 10 per millimeter squared, whereas uh, asthmatics, and these are very mild asthmatics, have uh, raised levels both in the epithelium and uh, the uh, submucosa. And they have features of activation, so dissolution of the, the granules, swelling of the granules. So this was 90 when the paper was published. It took a long time, about 10 years, for the papers to start to come out, uh, which focused on uh, eosinophils in severe disease. And this was a study uh, we did in, uh, in uh, at the turn of the millennium, where you can see that uh, uh, as you progress through the uh, clinical severity stages from intermittent, mild to moderate to severe, Broadly, the numbers of eosinophils in sputum uh, increase. Now, this is a, a log scale, so these are quite, uh, quite striking uh, uh, differences. And what what you need to take away from this slide is the enormous variability. So there are some uh, uh, people with severe asthma who have uh, normal eosinophil counts, and there are those who have where it goes literally through the roof. Now, this particular person was in Davos, in Switzerland, where there's no allergen at that altitude, uh, and they were treated very carefully. Uh, adherence was uh, checked because the nurse actually waited till the patient swallowed their treatment and they went, ah, to show that they had emptied their mouth. And this individual was on 40 milligrams of prednisolone. At, at that time, I looked at that, I said, well, this is a sign of uh, resistance to corticosteroids. Now, uh, the second, uh, I think, seminal paper, which I want to share with you is, is this one uh, from, uh, uh, from Leicester in the UK, uh, which showed that if you target eosinophils, if you're guided in your treatment management of asthma, on top of managing the symptoms, you, you, you aim to reduce the eosinophil levels to within the normal range, that alone uh, will reduce exacerbations by nearly 70%. So I think this is a seminal paper, uh, which then uh, went on to uh, lead to the uh, development of, uh, of biologics. The other paper, uh, a paper was uh, from uh, Sally Wenzel's group, which uh, I think very nicely showed the importance of uh, eosinophils, comparing uh, eosinophilic uh, no, uh, or non-eosinophil forms of asthma to see that all manner of uh, uh, features of asthma are that much more pronounced if the patient has got eosinophils. Uh, in uh, their airways. And finally, the, the, this was the gateway paper which uh, opened up the, the era of biologics where the, a similar principle that was used in this paper uh, was uh, applied again by the Lester group. Uh, Ian Paywood was, uh, was the senior author, showing that if you select patients on the basis of eosinophilia and you treat them with an anti-AL5 uh, biologic, that's where you get efficacy. Up until then, all the papers all the studies were negative because, uh, uh, because uh, that included people with eosinophils and, and those without. So what are eosinophils? We can, the whole lecture could be dedicated to eosinophils. Uh, where's Matt's? Uh, there he is. Uh, uh, you can, you can uh, ask him about uh, eosinophils. 
Um, but the important thing is to appreciate that there's lots of things the eosinophil does. So in, in the 90s, when sort of, uh, we all looked to Jared Like for uh, inspiration about eosinophils, uh, the focus was on epithelial damage. But then as you can see, there's all sorts of things that the epithelium, uh, sorry, that eosinophils do. They activate fibroblasts. In other words, they lead to tissue remodeling. But the, the thing that fascinated me, because I'm kind of, I have a, a, a penchant for, uh, uh, for immunology and T cells, that it can actually uh, in, in, uh, engage in T cell uh, activation. So uh, broadly speaking, where we stand today in terms of how eosinophils uh, are orchestrated, there are two ways. One, which is the, 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 the classical pathway, which involves uh, T helper two uh, cells, which produce uh, T, T2 cytokines. And interleukin-5, as you know, is a key cytokine that uh, enhances uh, proliferation of eosinophils activation and their survival. But uh, 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 around 2010, uh, in came uh, these ILC2 cells, which uh, use different uh, transcription uh, factors uh, to, to become activated. And they're not activated by allergen. Uh, and uh, they preferentially produce interleukin-5. So they, they don't produce interleukin-4. So they, these are two uh, pathways uh, whereby uh, eosinophils can become uh, attracted and activated uh, in, uh, in the tissue. This uh, pathway here on the right uh, is believed to be more relevant in so-called late onset uh, asthma in non-allergic uh, individuals. So from eosinophils, uh, uh, I just want to switch slightly to the concept of the so-called T2 high uh, asthma. And this, again, is a seminal paper uh, from uh, Prescott Woodruff and, uh, and John Fahey uh, at, at UC, uh, UCSF uh, from, the two, from the 2009, where they uh, uh, looked at uh, uh, brushings uh, of uh, people with, with asthma uh, um, and uh, uh, used a, a signature that is known to be expressed in the epithelium when epithelium is stimulated by interleukin-13 a T2 uh, cytokine, so periostin CLCA1 and serpin B2. And as you can see, there's a cluster of individuals uh, who express uh, high levels of these three uh, markers, transcriptomic markers of uh, T2 uh, disease. And uh, uh, if you read the paper, you'll see all the features of, uh, of uh, asthma in these individuals, such as uh, eosinophilia, uh, which is a, 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 a typical feature. And, and they, they call this uh, the T2 high uh, uh, phenotype. Uh, but it's important to note that at the time uh, they concluded, these authors concluded that this finding leads us to propose that asthma can be divided broadly into T2 high and T2 low uh, molecular phenotypes. I emphasize the word uh, broadly because sometimes I think to our detriment, uh, we, we think of this as a sort of gospel truth, uh, as T2 high and T2 low. Now, uh, why is this uh, important? If we are now, I think, sometimes getting mixed up and using the two uh, terms, T2 high and eosinophilic asthma, as if they were uh, one uh, and, uh, and, and, and the same. And that is not uh, correct, as I'll uh, go on to show. So the other thing is when, when we talk about uh, uh, principles, then it is important to, to have an understanding and, and a consensus of what we mean. So what, what do we mean by eosinophilia? So if you look at the various papers, I've just taken a few here to give you examples, you can see there's a, there's a broad range. Uh, the, uh, the definition has moved uh, with times. And I think it, sometimes this has been uh, a result of sort of opportunistic pursu pursuit of a result. In the pharmaceutical industry, uh, they, as pharmaceutical industry wants to have a big, as big a market as possible. So they, they push the concept of, of eosinophilia down to 150, because that's where you start to lose efficacy of D2, uh, of anti interleukin 5 uh, uh, bi biologics. Whereas if you go to your uh, hematology lab, they will tell you that normal eosinophilia is 500. So there's, there's, a, there's a slight pro problem there, but be that as it may, eosinophilia is really a helpful concept and, and, and a helpful, it's very helpful for us to understand 
how uh, disease uh, uh, develops. So uh, this is a very important slide from David Price, uh, uh, which shows that as the, as the strata of eosinophils, so the, the first stratum is from two to 300, and the, sec, the final stratum is over a thousand, you can see that the greater the number of uh, eosinophils, the odds ratios for severe exacerbations really increase almost linearly. And the same is true uh, for asthma control. So really that does emphasize the importance uh, of eosinophils. And so, uh, uh, of course, uh, those of us who are interested in, in the severe uh, end of the asthma spectrum, uh, we're keen to kind of place the eosinophils, uh, define its role uh, in relation to uh, asthma severity. So this concept of severe eosinophilic asthma was uh, developed, and these are the clinical uh, features the, uh, and the inflammatory features. And uh, in, uh, if, you, if you look overall, the, the view has been that approximately 50% of uh, severe asthmatics have this eosinophilic uh, uh, phenotype. And so what to me this means is that there's, as I said from that Davos uh, observation, that uh, this really reflects the fact that eosinophilia in these individuals is not responsive to steroids. So you would call it uh, insensitivity, refractoriness, whatever term uh, you wish to use. However, uh, this was a study we, uh, we published uh, not, not long ago where we uh, looked at, we had data, clinical data from uh, uh, patients with, uh, with severe asthma. Uh, and we looked very carefully, Adnan, Adnan Azim looked at this and, uh, and stratified the, the data into persistent eosinophilia. So wherever, whenever he looked, these patients had eosinophilia, intermittent, rare, or never. And you can see that only just under 17% of patients never had eosinophilia, were truly uh, non-eosinophilic. The others were uh, uh, quite a few, about a, a third each, were either persistent, intermittent, and rare. So if you add it all up, uh, 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 eosinophilic uh, asthma it constitutes uh, uh, around 80% of patients, at least uh, in this study. And so I think it's only uh, correct uh, for the GINA guidelines, the, uh, the Global Initiative for Asthma uh, guidelines that produces, uh, you know, steers us to, to think together uh, about, about this disease. Uh, for that reason, I think recommends that, uh, rightly so, that uh, uh, eosinophils, you should never take a single time point to conclude whether a patient is or isn't uh, uh, eosinophilic. And this is a study that if you haven't read this, I would uh, recommend that you do, in which we uh, use biomarkers uh, to uh, guide our management with uh, steroids. So uh, patients were stratified using uh, exhaled nitric oxide, blood eosinophils, and periostin, which is uh, 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 induced by interleukin-13. So these are uh, what you would call your classical uh, T2 biomarkers. And there were three strata. So uh, zero was all these biomarkers were low, uh, uh, two, uh, the, the uh, biomarkers were high, and there was the intermediate. And this guided us when patients came monthly uh, to recommend to the patient if they were classified as two, to up their dose of steroids. If one was to maintain the dose, sorry, uh, was to, uh, yes, to, to, uh, to maintain their dose, and zero was to reduce because, you know, they were really at the cusp of non-T2. Um, and in doing so, uh, we were able to show that we could significantly reduce the dose of steroids, be they oral or inhaled uh, steroids. And only 5% of the patients retain uh, uh, a biomarker low profile. In other words, the T2 phenotype uh, appeared in 95% of patients. What does that mean? That most asthma is T2 driven. And it's just the, the, the non-T2 is, uh, is a phenomenon uh, that appears uh, with uh, corticosteroid uh, treatment. So we really uh, have a slight problem that we're talking about uh, moving goalposts if we want to uh, define asthma as T2. So breath in, breath out. Eosinophilia is a biomarker risk of exacerbation treatment with corticosteroids. 
and response to anti-IL-5 treatment. And then I pose the question, is eosinophilia a homogeneous phenomenon? And is there more to asthma than eosinophils? Well, you kind of can expect what I'm gonna say. Yes, there's much more to asthma. There's enormous complexity. Uh, uh, this is from uh, an, uh, an asthma atlas that uh, we produced in uh, UBIP with lots of crosstalk uh, interactions and so on. So, which may, leads me to move on uh, to, to how we approach the treatment of these individuals. So the standard approach, uh, I, I think, and I, I, I'm afraid to say that uh, for most, uh, most diseases, we still have the sort of empirical approach, you know, one drug, uh, uh, one size fits for, uh, for all. And uh, uh, whereas in stratified medicine, we uh, use biomarkers, we use clinical in, uh, uh, features to uh, stratify, to cluster, produce clusters uh, of patients. So we stratify the disease. And, uh, but what we really should be aiming to do is to identify the, the features in the individual. And that means having predictive markers uh, so that according to the predictive markers, we would say, okay, this drug A is the best drug uh, for patient X. So how do we, how do we move uh, uh, towards uh, uh, precision medicine? So uh, we have uh, the, the omics uh, over the last uh, 10, 15 years, the omics uh, technologies have, uh, have really uh, improved enormously uh, and uh, you know these are the uh, the, the the key uh, omics uh, methods that uh, that one uh, uses. And the aim is really to be able to uh, not just stratify but personalize on the basis of the omics profile or the biomarker profile, so that we have an improved outcome and we have reduced uh, side effects because we're giving the right drug uh, to the uh, right patient. So this brings me to what uh, Professor Jarjour. Uh, uh, mentioned uh, in his very uh, nice introduction, uh, this uh, UBIAPRID, which, uh, which stands for Unbiased Biomarkers Predictive of Respiratory Disease. But it, it, it had the ambition to uh, venture into COPD as well, but uh, in, in the end, we uh, focused uh, on asthma because we didn't have enough money. Uh, but, so uh, what, what was this? We, of course, there's the, the, the patient cohort, uh, there's the sample collection, Biobank was uh, spread across 20 academic centers across Europe. Uh, we had 11 pharmaceutical companies helping us with this in a totally unrestricted manner. And we had uh, these uh, omics uh, uh, methods that uh, we brought into the, in, into the mix. The other challenge was what to do with the, with the data that you generate. Omics data are extremely complex and uh, uh, it was really, really a challenge. So we had to, uh, uh, think very long and hard. And the data uh, was then uh, reposited in, in something called uh, Transmart, uh, which maybe some of you have, uh, have used, developed by J&J &J and then uh, given to uh, academia. And uh, the ambition was to uh, produce uh, uh, clusters uh, that would be defined by these omics methods and uh, would be then referred to as the handprint of severe asthma. So uh, I'll give you some examples, two examples of what, what, uh, how powerful this approach is. So uh, we used uh, mass spec, uh, uh, high definition mass spec to uh, define all the proteins that, that you can think of in, and this is a, a, a study we did uh, with uh, induced uh, uh, sputum. And, uh, and the objective was to stratify patients according to their proteome rather than, uh, their clinical symptoms. And we have a lot to thank for uh, uh, Gunnar Carlson from, uh, uh, from California, who, uh, from Stanford University, who uh, is an amazing uh, guy and, and extremely generous. Although he had founded a company called IASD, which uh, enabled this, developed this uh, method of topological data analysis, is a foremost leader in, uh, in, top in topology. He actually gave this to us for free. Uh, he was uh, so uh, interested. Okay, so imagine this as a field and uh, each of these dots is at least two individuals who are very similar according to their protein profile in their sputum as measured by 
uh, by mass spectrometry. You see that there are 10 clusters uh, that uh, you can see that, that, that appear. And uh, what we then did was with, with, with TDA, with topological data analysis, you can superimpose onto your basic cluster structure. You can superimpose metadata, uh, for example, eosinophils, neutrophils, uh, the state of the mind, whatever, whatever you can superimpose on that and then uh, see what is typical for that cluster. So in this slide, I'm showing you how we superimpose onto that eosinophils, neutrophils, and atopy. And you can see here immediately that eosinophilia consists of three sub phenotypes. So, so that is the answer to my question. My first question that I raised in that slide uh, is, is it a homogeneous, is eosinophilia a homogeneous phenomenon? Well, it isn't. It is, uh, it is uh, at least certainly by, by, by a proteomic subclassification, uh, it, is, it consists of at least three uh, sub phenotypes. So if you look at these uh, three sub phenotypes uh, here on the left in this, in this blue block, um, they are characterized by, if you look, if you apply transcriptomics, to the same sputum samples, you see that they, uh, that they do differ in terms of T2, T1, uh, uh, expression of T2, T1 uh, uh, genes uh, relative to the other, uh, other clusters, but there are some differences between them. So again, uh, stating the fact that uh, not only the, uh, is eosinophilia, uh, is one able to subclassify eosinophilia according to uh, to the proteins, but also by uh, the uh, state of their uh, of the genes uh, in the in the inflammatory cells. So you get a plethora of uh, information, which is extremely helpful. And of course, uh, I don't have the time to show this, but but by and large, if you uh, if you scan across that field, if you fly over it, and, and you look at the expression of genes, you see that as you move from the left side of the field onto the right and up. Uh, the the TH2 uh, the genes that are characteristic of TH2 uh, mechanisms uh, start to uh, to wane, whereas the uh, TH1s uh, increase. Okay, so uh, going back to this concept that uh, the clinical relevance of eosinophilia, again, I'm going to ask the questions: Are all eosinophilic patients the same? So. If we take the broad classification, stratification of eosinophilia according to the cutoff of 300 and 150, you can stratify uh, patients uh, into these uh, three categories. Now, uh, at the time of, uh, of, uh, of ubipred, why can't I move this a little bit? Um, the, uh, the, the cutoff for most, uh, uh, for most biologics was uh, 300. So we wanted to see is, there, uh, is this a homogeneous uh, group of uh, individuals? And uh, so uh, we uh, used unbiased clustering of, of blood, uh, transcriptomics, uh, again, just focusing on that group who would, who would qualify for treatment with a T2 uh, biologic, um, using a topological data analysis apl and applying a method that we developed in Southampton, the so-called Morse method, which gives you a third dimension uh, we could see that there were three clusters uh, based on gene expression uh, in these eosinophilic patients, all of whom would be uh, would qualify for treatment with, let's say, you know, mepolizumab or benralizumab. And so uh, we were interested to see, well, what is, what is their uh, their uh, gene expression profile? And we were focused on on the you know T2, T1, and T17 uh, genes and. Uh, to cut a long uh, story short, uh, these uh, clusters, uh, the E1 cluster, which is the cluster here, uh, was predominantly characterized by an overexpression of interferon gamma. Okay, so eosinophilic asthma and, and the predominant gene, uh, gene profile is, is a T1 profile. Okay, that, that, that you, you, would, you wouldn't expect that. Uh, the E2 uh, was a, a typical T2, but then there's this E3, which consisted of T2 and T17. IL-17 was overexpressed in these individuals. So that kind of muddies the water. The simplicity disappears. The simplicity of the dogma that T2 cytokines equals eosinophilia 
uh, it just doesn't, doesn't uh, uh, stand up to scrutiny. Okay, so the second example I want to show you is, uh, is where we looked at, a, a, again, by mass spectrometry, really sophisticated stuff, uh, and using uh, the topological uh, data analysis from, uh, from Stanford, uh, we, uh, uh, we did a, a lipidomic screen uh, in sputum of individuals from, from UBIFID. So this is the, you can, you can zoom in, zoom out like you do with a microscope to get higher or lower resolution. And this is the first uh, using sort of relatively low resolution. You see that a lot of individuals uh, fit into the score uh, and they're predominantly mild individuals, mild asthmatics or healthy individuals. And then there's this flare. But then if you zoom in and then you get a higher resolution, <clears throat> you begin to see uh, these, uh, these clusters. And uh, if I were to superimpose onto this, uh, the numbers of eosinophils, this would be an eosinophil cluster and the, the, the neutrophilic clusters would be uh, on uh, the right side. So let's look at uh, the clinical features of, uh, of these clusters. So there, uh, uh, as you can see, there's, uh, the core clusters is four and there's five in the flare. Uh, and I'm just gonna focus on the eosinophilic cluster, the F3 cluster. So what are the clinical fe features of these uh, individuals? Of course, they have sputum eosinophilia. So the average was uh, 26%. Uh, um, what about blood eosinophilia? The average was 400 cells per microliter. Uh, what about exhaled nitric oxide? Average was 54, that's pretty high. As you know, normal range is uh, up to 25. Um, and uh, what about oral corticosteroids there? Uh, mean dose was six milligrams. So these are steroid resistant hyperosinophilic uh, individuals with, uh, with a lipidomic profile uh, that looks like, uh, like that. So what is that a lipidomic profile? Well, uh, cholesterol esters, uh, phosphatidylcholine and, and, and cholesterol, uh, uh, were the features of uh, that, 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 that stood out. Um, so I have to admit ignorance uh, about, uh, about lipidomics. So it took really the, the brains of a, my colleague, Tony Postle, who's, uh, who's, uh, who knows everything about, uh, about lipids, uh, to, to, to tell us what this all meant. So uh, these, uh, uh, these non-surfactant, these lipids are not part of surfactant. Uh, DPPC is your, your key lipid species in surfactant, which you know is, 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 is relevant for both uh, regulating the immune system in the, in the small areas, but also for keeping the airways uh, open. And so we came up <clears throat> with this explanation, which uh, uh, we put in our, uh, in our discussion, the paper that recently came out, uh, is that uh, these, uh, uh, these uh, specific uh, non uh, surfactant uh, uh, lipids are released from, uh, from granulocytes, uh, either neutrophils or uh, eosinophils. And uh, we did speculate a little bit, I admit it's, it's pure speculation that they may also come uh, from uh, vesicles. And as a consequence, they disrupt the normal function of, uh, of eosinophils, uh, sorry, of the surfactant. Um, and, and, and therefore we think that they may have uh, an important role, but of course that's uh, open to, uh, to, to further studies. Okay, so having uh, reviewed very quickly the, the T2 high, whichever way we want to define it, let's talk about T2 low again, whichever way uh, we want to define it. So uh, I just want to focus a little bit on interleukin 17, which is, uh, uh, produced by a number of cell types is uh, thought to be steroid resistant. Professor Bussey knows that clinical trials to date have been negative when uh, anti-IL-17 drugs were used uh, in severe asthma. So uh, in UBIPRED, we uh, use the same, uh, the same three omics, uh, transcriptomic uh, biomarkers for T2 high, serpent, CLACA1, and periostin. And as you can see, there's a cluster of severe asthmatic individuals, all these black rods means that they're severe. Uh, and in the opposite corner, when you use biomarkers, transcriptomic biomarkers for interleukin 17, so in other words, uh, genes that would be activated if you use uh, epithelial cultures and you stimulated them with interleukin 17, you see that there's a cluster at the very opposite end. So there's a yin and yang um, 
uh, uh, in other words, this exclusivity, uh, it, when there is uh, interleukin-17 expression, uh, 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 evidence of interleukin-17 activation, uh, that's not the patient, the same patients that have uh, uh, activation of, of T2 cytokines. So this is in contrast to what we saw in blood. In the tissue itself, the expression of T2 and, uh, and T17 uh, is, uh, is exclusive. What are the features of these T17 uh, high individuals? So follow my cursor, please. Busy slide. These are T17 high. And again, follow my cursor. So in terms of atopy, there's really no, uh, no difference between the T2 high and the other groups. Um, what about smoking? This is where they differed quite a bit. So the T2 high were all non-smokers and uh, whereas the T17 high, uh, about a third of them were uh, uh, were smokers or ex-smokers. Um, they had a history of nasal polyps, you see quite quite prevalent. Uh, and uh, probably as a consequence of that, uh, they were the ones who used more uh, antibiotics to treat you know, complications of chronic rhinosinusitis. And the other thing that, uh, that uh, jumped at us was that the, uh, the, the impact on the microbiome. So the channel diversity index tells you about uh, the skewing of the, uh, of the microbial uh, populations. In other words, a reduction, which is typical, uh, we know for people who are treated with lots of antibiotics and also uh, is uh, related to uh, asthma severity. So this is a, a, an interesting uh, phenotype that uh, seemed to be emerging. It was characterized by uh, increased sputum and submucosal uh, uh, neutrophils uh, by a slight increase uh, in, uh, in T cells. And then looking at the individuals, uh, in individual genes, uh, uh, what uh, shouldn't surprise us because this has been noted in, in, in models of, uh, uh, of uh, IL-17 uh, uh, disease, these are the sort of innate uh, in, uh, immune responses. But there was a reduction in the expression of genes uh, that uh, regulate the uh, uh, tight junction uh, function. And of those of you who are interested in, uh, in viruses, there was an upregulation of uh, ICAM-1. So then we thought, well, a, a lot of this smacks of uh, psoriasis. So we looked at whether there was an overlap of uh, with, with psoriasis. So we looked at the expression of genes in, in, in a very nice paper where uh, psoriatic lesions were compared with non-psoriatic ones. And these were the uh, genes that were overexpressed in, in the lesions in the skin. Uh, and these were then inactivated by brudalumab treatments or anti-IL-17, switched them off. But then when we looked at the genes that were overexpressed in, in our IL-17 uh, uh, asthmatic phenotype, you see that there was uh, quite a bit of concordance. So we wouldn't go so far as to call it psoriatic uh, asthma, but there's some features which I think are interesting. And what is, why is this relevant? Had, Bill, had you maybe selected on the basis of this, maybe there would have been a clinical uh, response to budalamab in, in, in that study. So conclusion so far is Lophilia is a biomarker, as I said, a useful biomarker. It's not a homogeneous phenomenon. We see some T2L mechanisms uh, emerging and some predictive biomarkers uh, are emerging. So what are the implications uh, for treatment? Why do we need better treatment? How do we choose? How do we predict clinical responses? Those are the key things. And the, so I think we, we, we need to uh, put, we need to definitely become much more holistic. Uh, and, and we need to think of not just disease, uh, inflammation, and disease remodeling, diseased organ remodeling, but there's this concept of people uh, remodeling, some of which is due to the disease itself, the comorbidities, but some of it unfortunately is due to <clears throat> the, the treatment we, we give them, so uh, or oral corticosteroids. Uh, comorbidities, uh, for those of you who are in training, please, please do not forget when you're seeing a patient with asthma, think about uh, comorbidities, they're very uh, prevalent uh, uh, indeed. So uh, in our clinics, we, uh, we definitely uh, assess these uh, very carefully and through either through multidisciplinary teams or through referrals uh, to colleagues with whom we form a diagnostic and therapeutic chain. 
uh, I'd like to single out uh, obesity because it, it is really uh, the plague of, of, of modern times. So 60% of US adult uh, severe asthmatics are, are obese. If you haven't read this paper by Peterson and colleagues, this is a really wonderful paper, which, which gives you a lot of uh, insight into you know, the metabolome and, and, you know, and the mechanism. So really worth, uh, worth reading. Uh, in the UK, uh, we're just as obese, maybe a little bit less obese uh, than, than you are in the US. Uh, but so, so those uh, in this study, the, the, the watch cohort, the Southampton watch cohort, we had 70% uh, of individuals with, uh, uh, who, who were depressed uh, had uh, obesity. Why am I linking depression? Because depression is linked uh, with obesity. And of course, it's also linked with obstructive sleep apnea. But that's a lot of very obese uh, in individuals who are really and truly uh, suffering. So they need, uh, they need our help. Uh. So how do we approach this so, uh, with this introduction? How does, what, 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 what do we do with that? So uh, I'm not going to talk about uh, the, the, the sort of the, the, the routine uh, approach to, uh, uh, to treatment, but the challenge is, of course, now with this, uh, the emerging uh, biologics, how do we then decide what to give to whom? Uh, and so this is another paper that uh, I think is really worth reading, uh, which, uh, which is very helpful, uh, which uh, goes to say uh, the following. Well, um, if you stratify patients according to their uh, Ig uh, Ig mechanisms uh, and uh, and blood eosinophils, you get these uh, you you get these four groups. So uh, if an individual uh, doesn't have evidence of Ig involvement, so in other words, they're not a topic, but have high eosinophil counts, then your choice is very simple. You you treat them with an anti eosinophilic uh, uh, drug, anti al five. Uh, if the uh, a person doesn't have many eosinophils but is highly atopic and has severe asthma, then omalizumab. The challenge is, uh, is what do you do here when there's a bit of eosinophilia, well, where eosinophilia is important, but also allergic mechanisms are important. And this is, this is really a, a bit of a quagmire. So uh, one way to look at this is, is to use this traffic light uh, uh, approach where you treat patients for four months with your, your best guess. Uh, and after four months, if the patient hasn't uh, responded, when you stop the treatment, you move to another one. In contrast, if the patient is, uh, is a super responder, stop, stop having exacerbations, feels much better, then you continue with that. The challenge is what you do uh, with those uh, in the middle. And the other challenge is that we don't have good ways of assessing them. Uh, so for melizumab, we use a very simple clinical tool, the, the, the so-called GEE, Global Evaluation of treatment effectiveness where you say, essentially ask the patient, how are you? Yes, I'm well. And, and you look at their FEV1, you know, good, good. Uh, uh, steroid use, yeah, okay, fine. And that's it. Okay, so we're good at integrating. I mean, that's, that's what we do as humans, right? We integrate, we cluster, all phenomena are clustered. Uh, but uh, for other biologics, uh, we just ask them, have you reduced your, uh, uh, have, has the number of exacerbations and uh, oral corticosteroids fallen? And if they have, then you say, okay, but well, you responded, uh, sir or madam. But we really want to have, be able to guide our patients to, to not go into this uh, like, you know, like blind and, and going into walking into the dark. So there are three biomarkers which have been considered. There's IgE, then there's XL nitric oxide driven by interleukin 13, and there's blood eosinophils driven by interleukin 5. So let's just focus a little bit on, uh, you know, eosinophilia and, uh, and, and uh, the anti-eosinophilic treatment. So as you know, uh, eosinophilia is driven by interleukin-5. Uh, and uh, so there's, how can you, and of course it acts via receptors on, uh, on eosinophils, these uh, triangles in red. Uh, so you can block the interleukin-5 or you can block uh, uh, the, you can uh, use uh, antibodies that bind to the interleukin-5 receptor and that activates the cytotoxic cells and that kills the eosinophils. So this, this way you reduce the numbers of eosinophils and this way you really uh, take them out uh, almost completely. So uh, is, is the eosinophilia a good biomarker for how well the patient is going to respond? Well, yes, it is. So the, the higher the, the baseline level of eosinophils, the better the, the odds ratio 
of preferential of good response to an anti-Al5 such as uh, mepolizumab. Well, what about what about exhaled uh, uh, nitric oxide? Not really. You see, there's there's really not much benefit uh, in in terms of it doesn't it doesn't stratify patients. I could go on and on and show you twenty slides, all essentially uh, negative. So we don't have good biomarkers uh, to uh, to assess the response uh, to uh, or let alone to predict the response to uh, to biologics. Uh, so we measure. Uh, the clinical response, but uh, we are very poor at uh, doing the pathological measurements and predicting the response. And so the final uh, part of my talk uh, uh, will be on an attempt to do this uh, prospectively, in other words, to find predictive biomarkers. Study of the mechanism of action uh, of omalizumab anti-IG in severe asthma somoza team, uh, a wonderful collective of colleagues, uh, uh, 18 centers across uh, the UK, part of this translational research collaboration. Uh, 800 were patients were enrolled, uh, were screened, uh, 217 enrolled, 191 uh, succeeded to complete, etc. And we generated all manner of really good uh, omics uh, biomarkers. And uh, the, the, the we. Uh, uh, characterize the clinical response by, in terms of early response. So if they were seen after four months, did they by GEAT, did they respond? And these are the, uh, the omics uh, features of this volcano plot. Uh, these are the ones where, the, uh, uh, where there was a reduction in, omic, in the omics biomarkers. This was where there was a, a slight increase. Uh, and then we also stratify patients according to the uh, whether they had reduced exacerbations or OCS use by at least 50%. So one thing to look at is how little it takes to make a difference in response. So the, the, the vast majority of, of, of biomarkers do not change. Of course they don't because we're fairly homeostatic individuals. So you have subtle changes which, uh, which tell you that something important uh, is happening. And then we did a receiver operating characteristic analysis. You're, you may, you're probably all familiar, but those of you who aren't, uh, if uh, the specificity, when you draw the specificity and the sensitivity of that biomarker, uh, and, and it's just straight line, but it has no predictive value. If it is superb, then uh, you're, you're, you, you, the area under the curve is equal to one. But usually uh, the AUC is the area under the curve is less than one. So anything that's greater than 0.8 uh, is, uh, is considered to be uh, of excellent uh, predictive value. So I'm gonna uh, wrap up very quickly. The acute exacerbations uh, uh, were not predicted by blood eosinophil counts, putum eosinophil counts, serum Ig, pheno, or by gate. Uh, the same was also true. There was no way to predict the early response uh, itself. And really what stood out was uh, plasma lipids, which gave AUCs of 0.949 and 0.922, and breathomics. Uh, I wasn't surprised to see breathomics because after all, that's a good fingerprint of the status within the airways, but I was quite surprised to see how predictive uh, plasma, uh, plasma lipids were. So these are the AUCs, they're pretty good. Um, so in summary, uh, isonophilia is a biomarker of risk for exacerbation response to anti-L5 monoclonal antibody treatment. So these are the take-home messages. It's not a homogeneous phenomenon. And that's a challenge for us in research. It's a challenge for industry. Some T2 low mechanisms are emerging. We need biomarkers for those. Predicted biomarkers are emerging, but we need better ones, cheaper ones, more effective ones. Um, and please, please, for those of you who are clinicians, do not uh, forget the comorbidity. So what is the future need? And this is, this is one of the reasons why I've come to Madison, because there's a wonderful group of neuroscientists. And this is, the onus is on them. And we will help wherever we, if we can, and however way we can. Understanding the role of the mind is critical. Bill, you were a pioneer in that. You, know, you, you, you saw as a clinician that there was, there was something in the mind uh, which was which was terribly important. So the question is, is it a cause, is it effect, or both? I suspect it's both. What is the role of trauma 
childhood, whatever, a stress. And I ask the question, what is the role of, uh, role of steroids? So this is my final uh, slide. This is a painting by an individual with severe asthma. I don't know if a picture can be more telling of distress than this. And uh, the one thing that I mentioned to, uh, to our neuroscientist colleagues was I think this, these, this individual identifies, this is a picture of her. Uh, identifying herself with her severe asthma. And look at the anguish on her face. So on that note, thank you very much. Thank you very, very much, Radko, for an exciting tour de force of, of asthma, state-of-the-art uh, research and management. Open for questions. Um, so either I'm going to bring you a, a microphone, or if not, Radko, please repeat the question. Radko, thank you very much. It was a wonderful lecture, but I think also for the leadership to get to this point. I mean, unraveling and really providing clues and what asthma really is. The question, and I think you alluded to it already, is do you think within about five years, we're going to get to a point when we see a patient with asthma, we can plug in these data and the result can come out and say, Mrs. Smith has this type of asthma, and this is going to be the high probability medication that has been most likely to, to treat effectively. Because right now, we're playing low probabilities with about 50% of efficacy. Yeah, yeah. I, I think five years, I'm, I'm afraid to say five years, a bit too optimistic. Uh, it, it's, 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 a, it's a very nice ambition. Uh, I mean, I said five years. Uh, six years ago, uh, and, and we're not we're we're, we're not there. There there's reluctance. Uh, you know, the Somosa study costs six million dollars, uh, and we're told by uh, reviewers of the paper, you need uh, you need to reproduce this. So I need another six million dollars. Yeah, uh, there's no incentive, I'm afraid, for industry to to substratify, yeah? Uh, one way to do this, which, which I understand some insurance companies in the US do, that if the drug fails, they have to reimburse the, uh, the patient and, and, and the insurance company. That, that's maybe one way to make them do this. But, but in Europe, no, a, a failure is a failure, but thank you very much for spending a year of, of our biologic. Record. Tremendous talk. Thanks so much. The integration of the clinical with the mechanistic is really outstanding. And one of the things that you showed was that there was a, a TH17 uh, group of individuals and they tended to have smoke exposure. Um, could you, did that carry through into the lipidomics and the metabolomics and so forth? Or, you know, was it really an immunologic phenomenon or could you see that kind of as a, a global I'm not at all surprised that you're asking this question. So uh, we finished u about five years ago and we're still you know, chiseling away at the data. Uh, each, each omics study in itself is extremely complex. Uh, um, and, but, but what we're now doing is, is bringing the various omics uh, together. Uh, so there's another consortium called 3TR, uh, a, a big uh, European consortium, really well funded. They've done the transcriptome for us. They did RNA-seq. And that's a, a, an extremely rich data set. So whoever is doing omics and wants to go along this, this route, uh, that is the, the way to do it because it's extremely rich, enormous data sets, but also uh, pathways that you can then plug into your topological data now. So there are all sorts of fancy bioinformatics tools now, uh, uh, now, now being developed. And so we're waiting for those data to be produced and then we'll start connecting lipidomics to IL-17 and this and that. At, at, at the moment, it, it, it doesn't lend itself. The integration is, 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 uh, is, is not straightforward of the various omics methods. So there's an online comment from Christy Bartos, the chief of rheumatology thanking you for incorporating lipidomics and uh, immunology into disease management. And 
what what I would like to kind of ask is is how how have we've learned from dermatology advances to apply that to asthma? Sorry, is, is the colleague a dermatologist or rheumatologist? Rheumatologist, immunology. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I, 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 I have the greatest respect for rheumatologists. I mean, we've learned from them uh, an enormous amount and, and they have completely transformed. That's what we'd, I'd like us to achieve. They have transformed, the, you know, uh, destructive arthritis is, 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 is simply not acceptable anymore, thanks to, so, so tell your colleague that, uh, that uh, you know, uh, they, they we're most, most grateful. In, indeed, we, we, we have very close links in that 3TR program with, uh, with rheumatologists and we're learning from them uh, a huge amount. I have a question for you. I know that you have a large uh, cohort of patients with severe asthma in your clinic at Southampton. And my question to you, you alluded to it into the comorbidities. So my question is for our colleagues who are treating patients in their clinic, out of a 10 patients or 100 patients with severe asthma that comes to your clinic because they probably don't have, they have an asthma that's not responding to treatment. When you address the comorbidity, what, what percent of patients do you think they remain with have severe asthma and need biologic and how many, what percent actually get better with addressing comorbidities and uh, compliance? I mean, if, if we address the- If you address the comorbidity, how many of them still are suffering from asthma or as severe asthma? Oh, they, 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 they continue. So we, we have a series of, uh, of patients who had, uh, who underwent weight, uh, weight reduction surgery. The improvement is staggering. Okay. It's, 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 it's staggering the, 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 how much improvement uh, there is. Uh, but, you know, these are very dramatic, uh, you know, and not risk-free uh, forms of surgery. So we, we do them extremely carefully, not, not terribly, uh, terribly often. There's now this GLP-1, uh, you know, the glucagon, uh, which, which, which has, uh, you know, good success. Uh, I don't know, but you know, 10, 15 percent. Uh, we'll see what that. Uh, so we're actually preparing to do a trial in uh, in the UK, a multi-center trial. Um, that that to me will be the the, the the better way. I suspect you know it's it's not like you know if you if if they lose their weight that the asthma goes away completely. No, uh, it's it's not driven solely by by their obesity. But but I think it 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 it, it you know if you if you manage to bring it under control, then you uh, you you create the conditions for for the asthma to become a lot milder. My question. My other question to you is: you alluded to the role of microbiome, and my question to you is: is is the lack of diversity a cause or a result? Because today, as you know, there are actually trials to try to improve the microbiome by giving bacterial products. And do you think that's going to work, or do you think that the lack of diversity is actually not the cause, but the result of all the other things. And it's not really a causal, it's just an epiphenomena. I, 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 I think it's impossible to say with certainty, but my, my, I'd, I'd hedge my bet that it is a, a result of, uh, of, 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 of the disease. It's, it's not, not the cause, yeah. Uh, and, and unfortunately, we still give antibiotics uh, far too much uh, to people with... Uh, with severe asthma. It's one of those things, so better give them than, than be sorry if you're missing something. Well, if no other question, thank you so very much, Radko, for a fantastic presentation. Thank you. Thanks.